Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the National Institute of Statistical Science panel on the role of biostatistics in an increasingly big data and data science world. Uh, my name is David Ben Kesser. I'll be the moderator of the panel today, and I'm very excited to be a part of this discussion. Uh, on the one hand, this is a discussion that has really been a constant since the advent of biostatistics as a field. For, for decades, our scientific collaborators uh, have been pushing the boundaries of the data that is possible to collect, which always spurs the need for new methodological developments in order to appropriately extract in information and knowledge uh, from the new data sources. Uh, more recently, we've all borne witness to public health crises uh, that have pushed even further the boundaries of what we as statisticians and biostatisticians need to do to adapt to the fast pace uh, and, um, and pressing needs uh, of our time. Uh, in these and in so many other ways, biostatistics is, is in many ways always been in a constant state of transition. And yet the current moment really feels like a pivotal one for our field. Uh, the excitement around big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and data science at large has really reached a groundswell in recent years. Uh, we find that more people than ever are interested in quantitative and computational sciences, uh, and that more data are available than ever before. Uh, we continue to see new technologies emerge at such an incredible pace that each day we're faced with new uh, challenges, both mathematical, computational, and, and indeed ethical, that really call into focus you know, how we conduct research and education in the field of biostatistics. Uh, and so while we've always been sort of a field in a constant state of transition, it feels that this is a particularly important moment uh, for us as biostatisticians to continue to define and redefine what that means uh, in light of this new frontier of scientific research. Uh, so there's many uh, challenging and pressing questions that we're faced with, right? But these questions also present very exciting opportunities. And, and for that reason, I'm very pleased to be taking part in this panel discussion today uh, and, and very glad to be joined by an exceptional cadre of leaders in the field of biostatistics. We're joined today by Drs. Chi Hong Lin, Jeff Goldsmith, Yu Shear and Lance Waller. And I'm hoping that they can help set, shed some light on, on these challenges and opportunities that we face today. So I'll say a few words on the format of the session for today. So we'll first hear from each panelist for about 10 to 15 minutes. And they'll be addressing uh, comments around the question, what is the role of biostatistics in an increasingly big data and data science focused world? And what are the opportunities for synergies between biostatistics and other data science disciplines? So after each panelist presents, we'll have a moderated discussion uh, between the panelists, allowing them to comment on the other presentations that they've heard today. And we'll follow that by an open Q&A where our panelists will have a chance to answer your questions uh, from the audience. If you'd like to submit a question to our panelists, please feel free to do so using the Q&A feature of Zoom uh, at any time. And uh, time permitting, we hope to get to all of those questions, uh, and I'll do my best to do that. But um, but at the very least, we'll, we'll try to address um, a, a, a variety of questions that come from the audience. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speakers. Dr. Shihong Lin is a professor of biostatistics and statistics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard University. She currently is the coordinating director of the Program of Quantitative Genomics and a former chair of the Department of Biostatistics. Dr. Lin is an expert in statistical machine learning methods with a wide range of applications. She's won uh, a numerous prestigious awards, including the President's Award uh, of the Committee of the Presidents of Statistical Societies and the Marvin Zellin uh, Leadership in Statistical Science Award. I just heard that she was recently, as of maybe yesterday, elected to the National Academies of Science. So I'm very glad to uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Lin and hear her remarks. And uh, thank you so much, um, David, for the uh, great overview of this session and also for the very generous uh, introduction. And also I want to thank Sines uh, for organizing this event. It is critically important for us to think about where we stand uh, as a field and where we are going. So I will share my screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Great. Excellent, excellent. So I'll share with you some of the challenges and the, the, uh, we have faced in the last few years. And also uh, hopefully this will generate uh, opportunity for discussion. So we are definitely living in a digital era with a massive digital 
uh, data and also the challenge and the opportunities uh, with AI technologies. So for, for me, we have been working on the whole genome sequencing studies where data are massive and also the, uh, the digital uh, uh, devices data and also electronic medical record. And so like in the, especially in the last few months, every of us have already faced the, uh, already uh, field really felt the opportunities and uh, of the uh, AI, especially the chat GPT is just really disruptive and uh, science has created a lot of exciting opportunities. So we uh, have been, all of us have been asking ourselves that how should the both statistic position itself to stay as a quantitative leaders and make an impact in health science. So, so these are a few takeaways uh, while we're thinking about uh, where we stand and where we are going. The first takeaway is that the foundational bio statistics remain critical. And uh, so including like a probability inference and uh, the method, many classical methods are still useful for data analysis and also study design. So in particular for the uh, many uh, cross-sourcing data, those are observational study data and uh, the, the random sampling is difficult. And uh, so how can one address the bias issue? This is particularly a challenge during the, the pandemic. And the second takeaway and, uh, is that um, the deeper knowledge of involvement in computation, computational science, uh, domain science, play a critical role. And so when we think about the his, uh, historically, both statistics um, has these traditions of generating statistical method motivated by real application, and then apply the method to solve the real world problem. So this has not been changed. I think in the future, this remains critical. And uh, so, and uh, but also it's important for us to be a real player in the health data science. So we have to, I feel it's important for us to change the perce perception about ourselves. So like in the view of the statisticians, they need to be a scientist by knowing the domain science better and also be really a part of the domain science um, community. And in particular, so in order to solve important problem in health science, so it's really a three has three pillars and the both statistic, informatics, and CS, and also health science, they, the, the three pillars have to really work together. So, so basically, um, so in for the last point, and I want to emphasize that so it's important for the machine learning and domain science community view, we are part of them. And uh, then is um, so we, we make us really engage in those communities. So therefore, um, our voice can be really heard, and also they can become our partner and become our advocates instead of like competitors. The third takeaway is that um, scalable statistical inference for massive uh, health data is critical. And so because the data are like the data we deal with generally are very big. And so therefore the scalabilities of statistical method and machine learning method are critically important. And also those methods in order for them to make a real world impact it's important to in integrate the domain science. So in my field, it will be integrate the, the genetics. And, uh, and also the, the AIs and machine learning, so those methods uh, have been mainly focused on prediction. And so what is our niche? And uh, so then in order to transform the information to knowledge, statistical inference is critical. And so, about, so not pro every problem is prediction problem. It's one important thing about the, the inference about the parameter, about the causality. So like, uh, for example, this will help us to identify the drug target and the, in genetic studies and then develop the intervention and prevention strategies. And also um, uh, for us, um, the, so, uh, we, it's important to publish method paper in non-statistical journals and not only in statistical and about statistical journals and so in order to real uh, to make a real impact. So for example, uh, in nature and science uh, families. 
So just give you a quick overview of the, um, the type of data and the we deal with. And so the bulk bank map the other trend, the most well-known bulk banks are the UK bulk bank, involve the genome data, the electronic medical record, epidemiological data, imaging data, and wearable devices. And so besides the UKB data, and so other um, bulk banks, including like the Million Veteran Program that enroll a million people, and uh, all of us enroll a million people as well. So UK bulk bank has a half million. And so the UK Bio Bank already have like GWAS data, whole exome sequencing data, and whole genome sequencing data. So the goal is to analyze those massive data to help us develop the precision health, pre including precision intervention and precision medicine strategy. And so in the next few years, with um, millions of the whole genome, the whole exome data will be available. So we need to be ready. Just give you a sense how big data we deal with. And so this is example of the top map data. This is called the Transomic Position Medicine Program by NHLBI. So this is a FRIS-10 data, has about 185,000 whole genome and with many different uh, heart lung related disease trait and the disease. Um, so before the QC, and so it has a billion um, variants. So after the QC has 845 million variants. So if you think about the data, so basically it's about, about 200,000 rows, a billion columns. And then how can we analyze such data and make the result also make sense? And also the analysis has to be scalable. So therefore, we really have to understand the genetic in order to make the analysis make sense. And the method has to be developed in a way that can scan the genome very, very quickly instead of waiting for a month to get the result. And so in my so in order to analyze the whole genome sequencing data, one important problem we issue we need to deal with, first we need to functionally annotate the genome and to provide functional information. And for, for example, for top map data, it will be a billion variants. And so in order to do that, um, the, so we have developed a large functional annotation database. And so this we call the favorite database has 9 billion variants and including different functional information. So those data uh, are available in the cloud. So there are three, um, there are a few uh, cloud platform. And so this is NIH ecosystem, including Anvil by NIH, uh, G, uh, LB, uh, GRI, Biodata Catalyst by NHGRI. And so, in, and also UKB use the RAP based on DNA nucleus. So because the whole genome sequencing data are too big, and so therefore the data cannot be downloaded from the UKB anymore. So everything is on the cloud. And so in my life, I never thought as a statistician, I never thought I need to develop a database. And but in the last few years, because of the need, and so we started developing very large relational database using PostgreSQL. And so, so in order to develop the pipeline, so basically if one has the UKB data or top mind data, so first we have this large uh, genome data using the VCF file, one need to do the QCs, and uh, it's all in the cloud platform. And then the suppose you from top mind has a billion variants, then when we use this backend database, favor backend database, have a script called favor annotator to annotate the whole genome, this one billion variants. Then that creates this annotated whole genome data. And uh, then we analyze them run, running, we call the start pipeline to do the all kind of statistical analysis. And uh, so, so all of this has to be scalable and also the cost has to be low. And so with a smart uh, um, computational biologist and also software engineer in my, uh, in my team, I don't know how to build a database, but I know what I need. And so I find somebody help me do it. And then to annotate this, for example, top my 200,000 whole genome with 1 billion variants and in the cloud is only take three hours and $24. So that's very affordable. And so this work has been published in uh, two nature genetics paper and one nature method paper by a few postdocs and in the lab. So the fourth takeaway is that cloud-based ecosystem is the trend. And so the computing and, and also the um, Learning in the cloud system definitely is the trend. So, and we have to join the force.
So in the classical way to um, analyze the, the data generally for data sharing is basically bring the data to researchers. So for example, for top med data for the uh, UK Bob Bank data, and uh, so in the old days, uh, one basically download the um, electronic medical record data and also the GWAS data to the individual cluster. And uh, so if there are 1,000 investigator want to have the UK Bob Bank data and the data are downloaded a thousand times to different university cluster. And so there's data sharing and the basic is the data copy. There's no sharing of the infrastructure. But with the whole genome sequencing data, these are very large, hundreds of terabytes. And this type of model doesn't work very well. And also it also affects the data security. So what is the new model? The new model basically is this the bio data um, uh, the um, ecosystem. And so those are based on the cloud-based data sharing and computing. So basically bring the researcher to the data. And so for example, the, the multiple cloud system such as the uh, Google Cloud and also Amazon Cloud. And so, so like my lab member has been learning how to write the workflow descriptive languages and also develop app and in the cloud. So on the NH side, there are multiple uh, ecosystem, including the NHGRI Anvil and also NHLBI on the Biodata Catalyst. So my team has been working with the Biodata Catalyst team and to develop all those tools and which are available in the, in the Biodata Catalyst uh, platform. So this is the last takeaway. So the, just in the last few, um, just last few uh, years, I think, and with the, those exciting opportunities and the challenges, and so for us as a field, we have to think about to step out of our comfortable zone and basically cultivate the engineering and CS mindset, really to think about the disruptive uh, about statistics. Just give you an example. If you think about the chat GPT, large language models, and so the number of parameters in the chat GPT um, for chat GPT-3 is 175 billion. For four is 100 trillion. So as a statistician, and me, my first reaction is, this is overfitting with too many parameters and how can this work? And, uh, but the AI and the engineering mindset is completely different. The asset is, um, let's make it work. And then um, we'll make it work. And then later on, we think, think about the series. It's very similar to the deep learning philosophy. So I think this really helped really um, force us to really think about um, our positions and how can we do the disruptive bio statistic? Things may not work at, at the beginning as the first uh, class, and uh, but then we have to think about then how can we really think about a lot of our principles, and uh, then uh, this can help better position us in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. And uh, as a reminder to all our participants, we'll have an opportunity to have a Q&A for all of the panelists after this is over. So if you do have any questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A feature. Okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Dr. Jeff Goldsmith is an associate professor in biostatistics at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Uh, he is a true expert in functional data analysis and has led high impact studies involving applications in neuroimaging and wearable technologies, uh, among other areas. Uh, and his work maintains a particular focus on transparency and reproducibility, which, as we all know, is, is a crucial element of this uh, discussion around statistics and data science. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Goldsmith to hear his comments. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. We're all good there. Um, thanks very much for the introduction and for uh, including me on this panel. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about public health data science and biostatistics. Um, I've, I've very recently started a new role at the School of Public Health as an associate dean for, for public health data science at, at the School of Public Health. And so a lot of the way that I think about the role of biostatistics and what data science is sort of fits into a capacity of thinking about what do we mean about public health and data science in a way that is really interdisciplinary and, and reflects the impacts that other disciplines outside of biostatistics have? 
Um, what, I, what I'm worried a little bit about, though, is that I have more questions than answers for, for this panel. And so what I'm, what I'm going to sort of talk about is the way that I think about data science and the role of biostatistics. Um, I appreciated uh, in, in David's introductory comments that he said, this is something in some ways that our discipline has been grappling with for an extremely long time, that understanding what it is we need to do with new data sets has, has always been sort of fundamental to biostatistics. And at the same time, we seem to be in an era that is fundamentally different. And what I mean by that is 10 years ago, 12 years ago, data science as a discipline sort of didn't exist, that, that nobody was talking about what data science was. And so while we are, as biostatisticians, often faced with the same challenges now that we were 10 years ago, we sort of have to recognize that something out there has changed, that there has been some shift in the way that folks around us think about how to deal with quantitative information and how to work with data. Um, this is not exactly 10 years ago. I'll, I'll point out this figure, uh, the, a, a version of which showed up in Ji Hong's talk, is, uh, came out in just, I think, September 2010, so a little bit more than 10 years ago. And, and I'll get back to this in just a couple of minutes. Um, to illustrate why I think this is a, a, an important challenge to deal with. When I often, when I think about what does biostatistics have to bring to public health, I often sort of ask, well, what is public, or sorry, what does biostatistics have to bring to data science? I ask like, what is data science to begin with? This is a definition that I use in my class and it's similar to ones that have appeared in other cases. And as you read through the science of formulating and rigorously answering questions, data centric process, clarity, reproducibility, effective communication, ethical practices, I stand by all of that as a definition for data science, but I also recognize that it would apply to biostatistics in 2010 or epidemiology in 1990, that there's an awful lot that goes into any workable definition of data science that also describes what disciplines were doing before the advent of data science in general. And so thinking about why why data science happened, where did this come from, I think is an, is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, as an illustration of this, I sort of I, I worry about telling this anecdote in a group that's big enough that other folks might have been there. But I was at a conference in 2017. Hadley Wickham had given a keynote presentation at ISI, and he sort of talked through what I think was a, a standard presentation from him about the development of tools to encourage folks to adopt best practices in doing quantitative work. And that sometimes means big data, and sometimes it doesn't. There's a lot of really useful stuff there. But the first question that he got from the audience was something like, well, what is the point of data science? Why are we even talking about data scientists? Aren't we already data scientists? And what was really telling about that is that half of the audience completely agreed with that point, and the other half of the audience thought that it was a, a completely ridiculous thing to ask in the first place. And, and I guess one of the, the things that I like to keep in mind is that from the vantage point maybe of 2023, where, where I think in a lot of ways we're past that, there really was for a long time an identity crisis among statisticians. What, what is data science that is different from what we're doing? And I think in some ways, it's still hard to pin down exactly what differentiates data science as a discipline from biostatistics as a discipline or epidemiology as a discipline or computer science as a discipline. Um, I always, I, I find this sort of an interesting, uh, I, don't, I don't know, like piece of evidence from, from that time period. Um, the statistics identity crisis was a JSM session in 2015, and it was streamed nearly 10,000 times on YouTube, which I think has to have set a record for JSM uh, viewership. So what I, the, the way that I think about this, though, is that what data science has come to encapsulate is not, not so much any particular collection of skills, but a series of trends that were emerging at roughly the same time as points of, of emphasis. And that includes things like big data and an emphasis on prediction, and also things like reproducibility and interdisciplinary research. I also, I, I include here diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think part of that, for me, I think that there that this trend of trying to revamp the way that quantitative science is done in general included 
for a lot of people finding ways to elevate voices that had not historically been elevated. And I think that that it, for a lot of folks and, and me included, although maybe not universally, I think that that sort of got wrapped up in here as well. And the point that I like to make is that none of these trends are sort of like unique to data science. Like everybody was talking about this sort of throughout the scientific enterprise in general, but a lot of it sort of gets wrapped up into an, in, into an overall umbrella. And so I think that in a lot of ways, the connotation of data science, what people feel like data science means, uh, often is more important than any concrete definition that you could write down or any specific collection of skills that one thinks might be relevant to being data science, that there's sort of some things that feel a little bit more like data science and other things don't feel as much like data science. So big data and AI often sort of feel like data science, but I would argue small data sets and even qualitative data analysis can very much be data science as well. Um, and I think part of the reason, and, and this again is one of the things that, that I think is important to keep in mind is that Part of the reason that there was that split in the audience back in 2017 when folks were asking, you know, are we already doing data science, is that for a long time, the sort of core values of our discipline are, have been up for debate in some sense, that, that whether or not what we truly value is interdisciplinary research or what we truly value is the ability to engage in reproducible science. Yeah, we, we care about that an awful lot, but I think what data science illustrated, the emergence of data science illustrated is that one of the things that we needed to do as a discipline was really think about how to incorporate those stated values into the things that we demonstrate as valuable in our in our sort of day-to-day -day work. Um, I wanna revisit this because I, I find it is a, a useful way of thinking about, again, like what are what do we need to do as biostatisticians to remain relevant in the context of data science. And I, I actually, I, I find this figure a little bit flawed for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. But I, I also want to point out it was very influential early on that many data science training programs, for example, sprang up out of the idea that you could take a couple of stat classes and a couple of computer science classes and then sort of give some applied projects and all of a sudden data science would, would emerge. And I don't think that that's the case so much anymore, but, but certainly that was an influential perspective for a long time. The issue that I have with this is that it, it very easily segues into a figure that looks a little bit more like this, where there are a whole bunch of things that one sort of could say is a component of doing data science that you need sort of simultaneously to have statistics and AI and also visualization and domain knowledge and business thinking and a scientific mindset. And if you put all of this stuff together, then you end up being a data scientist. And, and the way that I think about this, and, and this is a, a figure that I've drawn from a talk by Angela Bassa, is that that intersection usually doesn't exist, that there aren't folks out there who are able to encapsulate super long lists of all of the skills that one might argue are necessary to be a data scientist. But, but that's fine. That doesn't mean that data scientists don't exist. It just means that defining what that is or pointing to this group as a data scientist to, to the exclusion of some other group is, is sort of a fool's errand. It's not, it's not going to be a useful exercise. Um, what, I, what I do think in the context of biostatistics and public health data science what, like, what do we bring to data science more broadly? For me, at least, it's the public health piece that is integral to at least how I think of myself as a biostatistician. That's the most important part. Um, the public health training, the, the aspects that I get outside of sort of core theoretical biostatistics, but the public health piece, I think, is what makes me most effective as a data scientist. And that includes thinking carefully about study design and sampling processes and the measurement that goes into understanding variables in a data set, understanding when and how we might be able to infer cause causation, that public health is inherently an interdisciplinary science, and it's critical to make sure that everybody is communicating effectively that there's real engagement with data ethics. And I think this is an area where biostatistics and public health data science really has an awful lot to say to data science more generally, that the history of our field being so closely tied with human subjects research means that we have very strong foundations in thinking about how to deal with data in this way. And then sort of following through on all of this, the sort of public dissemination and dialogue that is inherent in effective public health research and sort of by extension, critical for effective biostatistics. 
So like I said, I think I have more questions than answers. I, I don't know that I can say like, here are the things that biostatistics brings to data science or vice versa. But what I do think is that all quantitative disciplines, and, and I sort of say quantitative disciplines, things that are arguably data science, that there's to some degree, every discipline has struggled with a mismatch between what data science intends to value and how all of those values get mapped onto discipline specific emphases and points. And that we're sort of slowly over time incorporating that collection of values and in, incorporating that into what we mean as biostatisticians and data scientists. Um, I also think that this idea, at least in academia, I, I, I think data scientist is a sort of secondary identity. And, and what I, I sort of mean secondary identity in the same way that I refer to a statistics identity crisis, that it's sort of possible for folks in biostatistics and environmental health and epidemiology to have sort of uh, identify with their core discipline and with data science simultaneously and, and to sort of view that as two things being true at the same time. Um, the last point that I want to make, and I, I didn't have a great way to sort of squeeze this in, but it's one of the things that I think of as really important for our field, is recognizing that the floor of quantitative expertise among all of the groups that we collaborate with is rising, that every, everybody I work with now can import a data set and fit a lasso regression, and that's true for faculty members who I work with and also master students in environmental health, and so recognizing that that sort of floor of quantitative expertise is rising and figuring out what it is that we bring in that context in this sort of interdisciplinary capacity, that, that's, a, that's, that's a really important component um, that I don't have an answer to, but I'm, I'm excited to hear more from the panelists. So thanks very much. Hey, thank you, Dr. Goldsmith. Um, yeah, some great questions uh, that you've done my job for me that I will pose to the panel uh, in just a little bit. Okay, so next up we have uh, Dr. Lance Waller. Lance is a professor and former chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics here where I sit at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. I think he's sitting directly one floor below me at this exact moment. Uh, he's an expert in statistical methods for spatially referenced data with extremely wide ranging applications, uh, including environmental justice, conservation biology, and disease ecology, among many others. Uh, at Emory, uh, Lance currently leads uh, Woodruff Health Science Center's Strategic Initiatives in Data Science and is the co-director of Emory's new Center for AI Learning. And I think all of these roles have left them in a, a very unique position to pr provide some perspective on uh, the topic of the day. So I'll turn it over to you, Lance, to hear your thoughts. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks for NIST for hosting. Uh, it's, a, it's a great topic. Glad to see so many people online uh, watching. I don't have... Uh, uh, as well prepared deck of slides. So I just want to summarize and build on a few things that um, people have said on the role of biostatisticians in the field of biostatistics in a data science AI kind of world. Um, one aspect of in collaborating with people inside and outside of the health sciences, one of the things you find, um, you know, there's some great examples of success for AI, the the chat GPT things you're following, you know, the answers look true. But one of the aspects of the Turing test of if a computer can generate you know, artificial intelligence, can it generate something you can't tell if it's from a human or not, is its 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 point of success is deception. Um, so we have to realize that we we look at the string of words that are very readable and understandable, but we also it's helpful to get sort of an intuition on how machine learning works and share that with our friends. I don't mean to be critical of it because I think it's a tool we need to learn to use and appreciate and understand, not so much as a competitor for what traditional statistics does. So one of the examples we'll be running into, I think, is COVID showed us that we don't have timely population numbers. We don't know how many people live in a neighborhood at any given period of time. We have survey-based, you know, this, I work on the with the census um, Scientific Advisory Committee, and we've got a phenomenal system of sampling-based statistics building up, but how do we incorporate other data sets? So the proprietary data set in responding to an emergency might well be Facebook's uh, publicly available data for uh, the data for public good, where you are finding where people are at this moment, where they're posting. That might be the more relevant information than a very carefully done survey over a period of time. 
And I think what we'll see with an already alternative population numbers from that are proprietary algorithms, say built off the type of buildings, how many people would live in the building. So you get answers that look true. Uh, they are based on some data, um, but they also may not be answering the question at hand. Uh, they also may not report sort of levels of uncertainty as well. So I think we need to work with new types of data. Um, I think biostatistics brings this uh, a questioning of what are the cost of mistakes? So an algorithm that may work well in a commercial industry where it predicts a certain number of extra customers, you may not get exactly that number of customers, but if you got more than you did before, you'll make more money and it'll be a success. Or if you're dosing chemotherapy drugs, the cost of overdosing and underdosing are very, dis they're, they're not balanced at all. We don't wanna just be a little bit off one way or the other because we may either not help someone who could have helped or we may hurt somebody uh, in a profound way. So I think there's always a tension between doing what we can do. And we see a lot of the, the uh, rollout of new technology is saying, this is uh, in science or nature because we can do it. We're the first ones to do it. I think statistics often follows a little bit behind in, in, in saying, well, how should we do this? I think it, it's looking at questions of the best way to do it, how to minimize mistakes, how to maximize benefits, um, how should we do it? How should we interpret the results? I think the chat GPT example of uh, you get text that looks very accurate. Um, and one of the examples people will give is um, generating, generating references in um, the scientific literature. So it creates a list of authors. It creates a year. It creates a title with the keywords in it. And it creates a journal, all of which are associated with the topic, but none of them actually appeared together. Now we could fix this problem by plugging it into say PubMed or something like that and only include real ones. Um, but we have to start thinking about what, um, what we're getting and how best to use that information. So um, I think a role that statistics and biostatistics will play in this world is we need to rebuild our intuition and inference. So if you think of statistical methods as a family tree, I don't have a slide, but I can, I can wave my hands with the best of them. Um, so if you think of it, a family tree building up and from Ji Hong's slides, you have the roots of probability. We have statistical inference and learning information from that. And we go out on the branches and solving very particular questions. We have to remember that, that those branches are all developed under a certain assumptions. A lot of statistical methodology has been developed under the assumption that data were expensive and hard to get. So there was a lot of input into the design to get the best information and not waste your um, waste your time getting information that's not going to help you. So we wanted to get IID samples. We wanted to calculate the smallest sample size that gave the most information. In a data science world, data are plentiful. They're available. They may not be exactly what we need, but that's that's a different set of assumptions. We can go back to probabilities of the types of mistakes we can make. We can get how much information are we getting? What is the cost of a big data set that's correlated versus a smaller set that's independent or something in between? We need to rethink how do we put together different types of data set and get valid inference from that? So, uh, you know, the mantra I always think is design what you can, but model the rest. We need to bring in an intuition, not just to force fit uh, the new data world onto this tree of beautiful results from a different data world. We're going to have to regrow some of this. This requires some. It requires us to be curious on how to do something. It requires us to be creative, and it requires us to be constructively critical uh, of the results. So, um, I think these are all important elements of rebuilding a family tree or building a new tree in the forest that we contribute to. We may not be the sole proprietors or sole owners of the right way to do things. And we have to build that down a little bit. I think the statistical training has always been, I wish you had come to me earlier, I would have shown you how to do it the right way. Well, uh, I think the engineering mindset is we're gonna do what we can. And I think we should join in that with that sort of um, constructive, constructive criticism along the way, not constructive criticism saying, don't do it. So I think we wanna bring the knowledge we have. So in some sense, we need to teach this new dog some old tricks and our old dogs need to learn new tricks as well. So um, you starting his presentation before I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if that's the hook saying, hey, Lance, you need to forget it. 
But I, I wanted to give, I wanted to finish with two quick examples where our conceptual work, no worries, <laughs> our conceptual work can contribute to communication. Um, I don't know how many times in the beginning of COVID we saw the same sentence in news reports that we have a test with sensitive, you know, high sensitivity, high specificity, and it's wrong half the time. So it's a really short sentence. It has three percentages in it. They're all percentages of different things, but when you string them together, it, it uh, erodes trust in sort of performance measures and so on. They're like 90, 99%, 95%, and it's wrong half the time. It's that doesn't make any sense. So we spent some time um, with, and wrote in the Harvard Data Science Review. So I do have one slide. Now, if, if all of you out there have taken intro epidemiology classes or taught them or taken an intro biostatistics class, you'll remember the first example we always give for Bayes' theorem is, suppose you had a test that was highly sensitive and highly specific, should we just test everyone? Um, we often teach it as kind of a gotcha problem where you go, I don't know, that sounds like a good idea, and they go, wrong. And then we give you an equation, you plug things in, you see the prevalence matters, and then we walk away. And we don't walk away going, oh, I understand it now. We walk away going, I'm never going to trust a problem again, because it's always presented as it's, a, it's an amazing result. But it, we're teaching it um, in a way that I think tricks people. So we tried to think of a way, how can you teach this and get build some intuition about that sentence? Uh, both for talking to the press and talking to the public. Um, and we came up with this, let's just say it's a graphic representation of Bayes' theorem without an equation. So we use stick figures. And the top part, we have uh, the color of the head of the individual. They're red if they're diseased and they're blue. If they're not, they're holding a piece of paper that's their test result. Blue says they got a negative test. Red says they got a positive test. So if we have uh, a sample where we have um, the same number of people with and without the disease, and I had sensitivity 80%, specificity 90%. You can see I'm wrong one out of 10 times of the people who don't have disease, wrong uh, two out of 10 times those who do. So if I, I'm taking the same people and I rearrange them, so I put all of the red test results together and all the blue test results together, and now I can figure out the positive predictive value and the proportion, how many times the people with a positive test get it wrong. This number doesn't change that much. That's kind of what we expect to happen. But if the prevalence is very different and you're giving a lot more tests to people who don't have the disease, you can start to see how the positives are going to be more than half of the positive results. So we were trying to come up with a way that didn't require people to keep track of values, do the math, and calculate it. I'd say one other aspect where um, statistical thinking can help is in um, the definition of the false discovery rate. The false discovery rate was rethinking, this is my family tree analogy, for a long time we've had the type one error. Um, but in a GWAS study, and like Zihong said, at first you think, oh, that's overfitting. Why would I do, why would I, why would I do that? It doesn't fit well. And then um, the development of the false discovery rate took some convincing of the field to get it together. But I think you can come across that the, it's not an adjustment to the type one. It's not a multiple testing adjustment. It's more of a refiguring the question on what you really want to answer. For instance, uh, the, um, the type one error rate is what fraction of the time do I expect when the null is true, am I gonna reject the hypothesis? The, um, so you can think of that as a conditional probability. Null hypothesis is true. What's the probability of rejecting? The false discovery rate flips the conditioning and says, given that I've rejected, how often was the null hypothesis really true? So when we think about it in terms of conditional probability at the roots of the tree, we go, of course, those aren't the same thing. But they answer the question more specifically. If you did a lot of tests and these are the ones you rejected, you want to know how many times you made a mistake there, not overall. So I think there's some of these things that we need to go back to the roots, not necessarily completely in mathematics, but just in terms of our concept and answer our questions in the right context. So I hope that's helpful. It's a lot of hand waving, but um, the, I think the data science, where we fit into the data science and AI world is understanding the types of things that can go awry when we're making decisions and drawing inference see if we have answers that fit and answer those questions. And if they don't, then we need to come up with new ways to answer those questions.
but keep the questions uh, front and center and put those in the context of the data that are available. I'll leave off with, I think one of the really th nice things that Jeff said was um, giving people some working knowledge of how these work. And I'd have two book recommendations. Um, one of which is You Look Like a Thing and I Love You by uh, Janelle Shane. I think it's a really nice overview of how AI is strange and how it sort of thinks of patterns and builds off of patterns in a predictive world. And then on the AI ethics and um, uh, is the textbook, or it's a, it's a, a nonfiction book by Brian Christian called The Alignment Problem. It not only parallels a nice development of AI through the decades and based on the technology available, but the kinds of uh, rapid growth in some areas and then uh, challenges. We, 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 we build solutions to problems, but that will generate new problems we need to be aware of and look for. So thanks for the time. Thanks so much, Lance. Appreciate the perspective and the thoughts. Um, so our final speaker today will be Dr. Yu Shear, Professor of Biostatistics, Biomedical Informatics, and Health Policy at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, uh, where he currently serves as the chair of the Department of Biostatistics. Dr. Shear has led numerous groundbreaking studies in cancer research and has been heavily involved in regulatory policy and government oversight uh, regarding uh, new cancer therapeutics. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shear to hear his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. First of all, apologies, Lance. While you are talking, you have some sort of interaction from me. So anyway, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. For the next 10 to 15 minutes, what I do want to talk about is the, what are, let's self-study our strength and the weakness when we talk about a biostatistician and when we talk about the big data or data science, right? So I would like to share my screen. They are not, it's coming now. All right. All right, so that's, we already learned so many great speakers. What is the, the highlights about, we understand our strength. And then now like, let, me, let me summarize that we, uh, my opinion, what are, um, See, what what do we what do we understand ourselves? First of all, from the Xi Hong, we constantly learn that we are good in the statistical knowledge, right? So we are good in uh, basically uh, in the designing study, analyzing data, right? We have a strong foundation from probability, statistical inference, and the machine learning algorithm. We all train that. We all train our trainees. We all learn that. We have a solid particular our root, what I call this uh, so-called statistical inference. Another thing that I do want to talk about is our data pre-processing. I will give you several examples, depends how much time that I have. So when we deal with the big data, we tend to see, focus on the results of what those marker or those sets of marker, do they have a 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, do they have a 100% accuracy, so-called the prediction rate. But actually, we, while we're training, what is our focus? We always believe garbage in, garbage out. So the data pre-processing for some of the big data, I think that's our strength. I will share with you one recently published a science paper. They just use one sentence there, but I can tell you how you deal with a complex data set. Not all the complex data set can be merged together because we know the symptom paradox. We know each study, they have different type of the ascertainment bias. They have a different selection difference. Once you put them together as M, you may totally misinterpret the result. Those are what I think is our strength. We know all of this, what we call the garbage in, garbage out. The third, I think, is our strength is domain expertise. Biostatistician, we, after we graduate, we start to engage in the public health, in the medical center. So we have a very solid training about the domain. Since the first day I joined Vanderbilt, I started to work with the cancer center people. I started with the cancer project. So particularly have a particular organ side, the lung cancer, for instance, then you will know a lot of the, uh, the knowledge about the biomedical science familiar with the specific issue of the rise in healthcare data 
particularly in the, in the, in the phenotype in the certain area you are involved. So we really, Will versus the medical technology study design, we understand the bios and the regulatory requirement. Those are what I think is our strengths. Particularly, I will talk about study, the, the, the design, the study bios. There's no perfect study. I share one real example. Shi Hong just mentioned is to say uh, 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 US, uh, uh, you know, US precision medicine, all of us cohort. If you look at all of score or UK Biobank, they are not definitely is from a pure random sample. It's not represented the overall population. We all know that. Then if you have the certain study, give you one example, the recently the all of us published a paper used the, the, the FIBIC, the so-called the smart watch, and associate activity with the disease. You think about that all of the study. All of us, they have about 50% of the minority underrepresented, but on the other hand, do you know what's the study population for that particular study, which they want to correlate with the, with the activity, with the outcome? Is 90% of them 40 to 60 in the female, so that you can know that result. We are the biostatisticians, so we are well trained to know how to interpret, how to interpret that result, make sure it's reproducible. Right, or that it truly has the clinical impact about some sort of the generalizability. And all by natural in our gene, we are collaboration, right? So we are the biostatistician from very beginning. We know we work closely with the other stakeholders, such as clinician epidemiologists. I want to emphasize epidemiology here. If you're dealing with the so called the big data in the public health or in the medical field, I think our strength is because we know we work and we learned epidemiology is better than so-called traditional data scientists. So those are the things we that I think is our strength. And then we know how to ask the questions. We know how to design the study. We know how to avoid the bias. We know how to generate clean data. We understand building our genes, the, the importance of reproducible, the importance of the reproducible research in our, in our own training process. I share another ex a story with you. That is the, when I had a meeting, talk with the one Navy, I believe is the uh, engineering or the, 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 he's doing all this, uh, uh, the, is the data analysis. When we discuss reproducible study, and then he looked at me and say, well, you share, we don't care. At this moment, I just want to find the optimal solution, move me from A to B, with just as Xi Hong said, with the 10 billion parameters. But for this particular mission, I can move from A to B with the shortest time. Next time, I don't care. So then, but in the biomedical research, is that is the what is the concept that is totally against what we want to say. If this model work, we want it's reproducible for the rest of for the future patient with a similar condition. So those are kind of the, the, the concepts different, but for our, what to me, for our training, we know the importance of collaborate. We are true team scientists. On the other hand, if, if you ask me, then what are our weaknesses? First of all, some of you already mentioned the computational skills. Honestly, if we all use R, if you see how many are truly parallel computing, if we are seeing more and more big data, and if computing time is more and more important, right? So, um, so the, our programming skills, is that enough or not? That is what we think about. That is a computing skill. And uh, another part is the big data infrastructure. Particularly, you know, at this moment, one big change is bring the data to the investigator. That era may no longer exist once you deal with the big data set. Bring the investigator, bring the people to the data. That perhaps would be the future, then that which require the crowd computing environment. We familiar with, we train our students, our trainings even include ourselves. Do we have a sufficient computing or crowd computing environment training? And the deal with large data set, like Shi Hong gave a couple of the 
examples. And then most importantly is the, the data structure, how we structure the data, how we merge, how you're going to deal with as a multiple big data set. That is the, the, what I view that is the, our, one of our weakness. And then the other part is interdiscipline skills. This is nothing related to technology. I want to ask everybody, think about this. At this moment, all the top universe, don't say top, all the major university, all the university who has the data science institute, how many of those institutes are lead by the statistician or the biostatistician? What the people from outside look at us is more is that more focus on our territory, understand our statistical inference, probability, or in there, they have some idea. The reason I want to find a biostatistic, they just want to, I just want to give in the p value. Or on the other hand, do we have sufficient training for interdiscipline skills? Even if you deal with larger scale study, do we have the train, do we have the skills even to deal with the project management? or the communications, or somehow marketing ourselves, let the people know we are not only focused on particular statistical skill. We do have the leadership. We can not only work with the other stakeholder, we can be the leader among all the stakeholders. And those are the things what we call the interdisciplinary skills. So those are the, the, those are the several things. I think I already spent enough time. So. Uh, but but let me summarize what I think. Overfeeding to us in the biomedical field, it is an issue. It is an important issue and that we need us the gatekeeper. We need to really truly evaluate, understand where the current things in front of us from the study design. Design is the design is appropriate. Give you another example. People say, I use very complicated machine learning, find a true predictive file marker that I want to publish in your journal. Actually, I will another has a job oncology, uh, associate editor for statistics. And then you will ask that you want to say true predictive file marker. What is the de definition of that? In the statistical term, you have to show is interaction. You have to show that marker only work for that treatment that's called predictive biomarker, but that marker signature will not work for the, for, for, for the other situation. So you have to show this interaction. If you were designed it and even designed other way, how can you say that's a predictive biomarker? So what, that's what I say from the experimental design to data pre-processing, when we do the data analysis, we'll come all the method. However, our training, I think we should continuously to emphasize about the reproducible research. Is that result or is that design? Is that, is that, is, is that the data analysis result is truly can be reused for, it's useful, it's true clinical knowledge for the future patient have the similar condition. That's all I want to share, but I have a lot of other slides, but I just want to stop here. I think we'll have a lot of the great discussion in the ledger. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shear, and thanks to all our panelists for providing uh, very thought-provoking insights. So looking forward to a rich discussion now. So I'll open the floor to our panelists at this moment. If there's Anything you'd like to add or comment on what you heard from the other panelists? Um, and if not, then I will jump into um, questions that we've received from the audience. Okay, well, I'm gonna now uh, force you to comment on some of the things that the other uh, panelists have said or, or try my best. Um, so I'd like to come back uh, to one of the, um, the, the the poignant points of, of Dr. Lin's uh, message, which was, you know, thinking about and adopting more of an engineering mindset so that we can do uh, sort of disruptive biostatistics, a great, great term. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you guys to comment on this, this kind of uh, distinction between engineering, maybe CS and, and statistics, where on the CS side of things, it's very empirical and results are driven by what appears to work in practice. And in statistics, well, honestly, it's very hard to, to publish statistics and biostatistics work without some underlying theory. And I remember 
Uh, you know, I was in graduate school, the late Norm Breslow, uh, uh, Norm Breslow at some point made a comment that, that, you know, the very famous Cox model paper, the very first paper, there's no way it would have even been published today because it didn't yet know sort of the underlying theory that, that led to that, the, the asymptotics, let's say, of, of that estimator. Um, and, and, you know, as a, as a junior academic, someone who does work in, in these areas, it can be a, a little bit difficult to find the right niche of, of empirical, well, it looks like it works. Um, uh, but maybe it's too statistical for CS journals and well, maybe it's not quite enough theoretical for, for stat journals. So what can we do as a field to try to enable that type of uh, empirical work? And, um, and uh, I'd open the floor for any thoughts on that. Well, I, I think there's room for pretty good ideas. They don't always have to be the optimal ideas. So we have a range of journals and I think they all have their, their different flavors. Um, so, you know, I, I, part of it's finding the right home for your work. And when you're writing, you're thinking about who do I want to read this? Um, some of the work I do, I'm writing for my epidemiology colleagues or my geography colleagues. Uh, some I'm trying to write for this, the statistics colleagues, but also see each, each paper as a progress along a thought process, not the final answer. So if I can establish something that works pretty well, I have some nice simulation results for it. I think of an outlet that might appreciate that level of work. It might give me the seed for what the um, theory is. I don't usually work backwards. I usually don't start with theory and then and then work on that. Um, as a result, you know, maybe it looks a little, maybe my CV looks a little diffuse, but I have a lot of interest in helping people out. So I like working with people with interesting questions, data that's not perfect. Um, but they still need an answer. And I think that's that's a place where we can try to build. And I remember talking to David Brillinger once early in my career, and I said, how do you publish in all these cool areas? And he said, I don't tell people no very often. Um, he said, that keeps me busy. But oftentimes they're asking me the question because they have some newly enabled measurement of, he had elephant seal dives they were measuring and it didn't neatly fit into a regression or generalized linear models framework. How do you do that? So he said, well, let me think about the air, the noise in the measurements, how the measurements come together, what question you really want to answer. And he said, I, spending that time with them led to a much more interesting project than me coming up with a theory and then looking for data to fit that. I think the data-focused development is probably a feature of the data-rich world we're talking about. Thanks, Lance. I'd, I'd, I'd open to any other comments from the panel, or we can move on to the next question. Yeah, so I, I, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I was going to say that I'm not entirely convinced that the mindset of like, well, let's let's get it to work is clearly an engineering mindset, uh, that that's not something that is statistical in nature. And, and if, I don't know if this is a bold thing to admit. I'm not sure I've ever like published a theorem and put it out there because that's just not the way that I prefer to do statistics. I think the the problems that I find most interesting to work on are when I have collaborators who come in and say like, I have a data problem that I need to solve and we find a solution to it. And if I can convince myself and other statisticians that like this is a solution that's viable and it works, and also it's beneficial to what the collaborators are trying to answer, then like, great, that's for me, that's good statistical work, right? And, and that's sort of the most interesting things that I work on. I guess, it, you know, it's also I, in the collaborations that I've had with engineers or computer scientists, it's not like they don't prove theorems. Often they have pretty advanced theoretical results for the things that they're working on. But where I have often found the contributions that I can make in that setting, knowing that I'm I'm not going to outprove something in matrix factorization and in, in, some, in something like this, but like often where the contribution that I can make in those settings is to say like the theoretical results that work very well in computer vision where data are pretty clean to begin with, they don't work when you're dealing with air pollution data. And what we need to do is think about like, how do you take something that might be theoretically optimal in one setting and like have it answer a question over here? And so I, I guess what I what I mean by that, or sort of the point of all of this, is to recognize that like 
doing things that are useful with data should, in, in my opinion, be sort of like a core biostatistical value, something that we can do and we have done and we continue to do. And that also is something that's relevant to, to data science more broadly, but is not inherently like an engineering mindset sort of a thing. And I guess, I don't know, I think to the extent that we can broaden what we think of as effective biostatistics to include that while also making space for ensuring that things are theoretically optimal. Of course, like that should still be core biostatistics as well, but having a broad enough definition of biostatistics for ourselves to allow for all of those things, I think is gonna be, is, is going to be important. Thanks, Shi Hong. Did you have a, a couple yeah, of quick comments? I, I want to add a few points and that both Lance and Jeff make a great point. I think it's in particular that, um, so we need to think about the important big problem. And uh, so the so historically in our field and the methodology development is generally based on a real problem, motivated by real problem. I think this doesn't change. We still need to motivate the methodology research and motivate uh, from the real important uh, problems. And then, but when we think about the methodology research, this word we probably traditionally, I think, for us, like for me, if the method doesn't have a strong statistical foundation, it doesn't make me feel comfortable, right? And uh, but I think if engineering man said yes, they they probably doesn't have a strong theory, but if they try to see how to make that work, and uh, then yeah. they turn around they figure out the theory. If you think about Cox model, for example, partial likelihood when Cox first proposed partial likelihood, there was no Martin Field theory, and uh, he just had this great intuition saying partial likelihood can, may work and then develop the method. Then later on in the next 10 or 20 years, those Martingale theory came out. And so I think this type of examples, I think can motivate us to think about how we want to move forward. And so probably then the, the traditional, um, the, we can be op more open-minded about the method, even we, this can, including computational method, but we don't have a strong theory yet. And to see the intuition says it may work. And we entertain open to those ideas. And that's, so this can yeah. help us. Otherwise, we may become irrelevant. Right. So, so let me add a very quick comment on that. We, I totally agree. We should open mind, accept it. The, you know, different, no matter with or without so-called a solid statistical theory behind. If, if, the, if the engineering think it's worse, that's fine. But what is our role? We can evaluate what the true, because we are still in the biostatistician, look at the biomedical health data set. What's the true clinical effect on that, right? So we can design quickly platform design to see your algorithm. For instance, all the FDA approved the AI algorithm you know, FDA only allowed them to do the marketing. They never evaluate true clinical benefit. I think our role is easily to move that so-called not statistical based method we welcome, but to truly evaluate. I still move back to my fundamental belief in the biomedical research. You still care about clinical benefit. Clinical effect is that reproducible and also what is the truly unbiased design to answer the question about the things you, the engineer develop. That's what I think our value added to this whole process. Yeah, fully Thank agree, you. fully agree. So I, I think in the name of time, we'll, we'll move to uh, the next question. So there have been a couple of questions that have come into Q&A uh, that I think are, uh, you you know, uniquely great questions for this panel who have all held leadership positions at major universities over the last several years during this explosion of interest in data science. And I'll paraphrase the questions in the chat. Um, they're essentially about how do, how do we position, you know, academic biostatistics departments for success in this field? We've seen departments change names, for example. Um, is that the right thing to do or are there better approaches, you know, so that we can stay relevant both within our own institution, but in the wider research community as well. An another question that is thinking about recruiting more diverse faculty members to have in, how in, in departments of biostatistics versus just those trained in, in stat and biostat. So I would welcome your perspectives on that. I can start with first. Um, as the chair of biostatistics at Vanderbilt, um, 
in last few years, we we yes, we still keep the name Department of Biostatistics because we still think that is the uh, that is appropriate um, to represent the focus of this department. However, our department faculty member, we start to recruit a computer science PhD to join the department, engineering PhD to join the department. As long as their research focus is affiliated, actually tied closely with the statistical or biostatistic. And at this moment, we do have uh, uh, at least a half dozen or more than the, uh, the, the primary faculty member. They are doing so-called traditional, what they define as a bioinformatics, but they work nicely closely with the traditional biostatistician to generate such a kind of good interaction. So my opinion is the, um, the without without rename this biostatistic, no matter what, as I mentioned, the crop computing, you cannot avoid, right? So all this parallel computing or the crowd storage or plus the, com the advanced computational skills, so all of this, it will exist no matter you like or not. Not only single cell sequencing, special omics to all the other microbiome data, they are coming, we cannot say, hey, we are, I'm the traditional biostatistics, I don't touch that. So in some way, we need to make this department rich enough, broad enough to can cover all the needs from the uh, biomedical research needs. That's how I feel. The answer is yes, short answer, we did add different faculty from different so-called non-traditional biostatistics training program. Um, I guess maybe, maybe I'll jump in next. I guess the, the issue that I would have with renaming, I have a couple of issues with renaming a department of biostatistics as something in data science. And I guess sort of the first is that I have a difficult time envisioning a discipline definition of data science that would map onto biostatistics and also exclude many quantitative people in environmental health or epidemiology or somewhere else. Meaning that if you are going to have a group of data scientists, I don't I don't think it would just sit very precisely on a biostatistics department. And at the same time, I think that there is good reason to maintain core discipline identities, that biostatistics and epidemiology are doing different things, even if people in both of those groups can be doing data science as well. And so I, I guess the way I think about the role of data science is to provide some way to bring together groups of folks who should be collaborating anyways and give them a basis for that collaboration about sort of an overarching goal of trying to answer questions with data. Um, in, in maybe in a similar way, like should should we expand who gets hired in departments of biostatistics or statistics? Sure, great. I'm more more than happy to. I think the the way that I would make that sort of evaluation is first, do I would 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 a candidate sort of feel at home in a biostatistics department and be able to make biostatistical contributions, whatever we sort of however broadly we might define that. But I also, you know, I want I would want to make sure that they are able to make contributions in public health and medicine as well, that narrowly hiring somebody in a computer science department, because we think that computer science should be more represented, if they're not going to be able to, to collaborate effectively, I think that's sort of problematic. But if somebody comes from computer science and they can solve problems in precision medicine, all for it. Yeah. Thanks, Lance or Shion. Would you like to add a? Add yeah, I, 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 I would like uh, add just a few things. I think both you and Jeff made excellent points about the faculty recruitment, diversity in faculty recruitment. So in my own department, about I would say twenty percent of faculties are not statistician. And uh, so they have been great to have them my colleague. So when we launch our um, uh, health data science master program. Uh, when I was a department chair, that probably was in the uh, um, maybe the uh, like two, uh, 2015 or 2016 ish. It's really wonderful to have them on faculty and to really help us to offer those data science courses. And uh, then um, 
So then we um so then uh, we have the algorithm course, we have the uh, the big data um uh, big data analytic course, and so it's it's just really wonderful. So I think the uh, definitely the so it will be great for the uh, both destinations, and we will come on uh, that community in our own. Uh, department make them feel comfortable. And the second thing I want to say is, I think Jiayang, this is a really exciting, uh, excellent question. So, so like, I, I'm very happy to see um, a good number of departments have changed the name on the two um, um, statistic and data science or both statistics and data science. And so that is a very great first step. And the, in the meantime, I think we have to really think hard. And uh, so how what's the critical skill we want to train our students and be such as and uh, so the, the this really need to have uh, engage the faculty not when we develop our own curriculum and engage the faculty who don't have statistical background this this can really help us to think about what type of leader we want in data science and then how can we train our students Yeah, thanks uh, for the comments from all the panelists. Uh, the the little bit I'll add is, I don't think changing a name by itself is sufficient. It has to you have to live up to that name. So if there's an and in your department name, that and is important. You don't want it to be an or. You don't want it to be statistics or data science. Like I'm in one part or one or the other. Otherwise, you're managing two departments at the same time. I think Shi Hong's uh, point about having you need to think of the core as dynamic. It may not be changing fast, but it's going to change over time as things happen. So you want to be in a kind of a constant questioning stage of are we developing the next generation in our field and are we evaluating that? And that's not just the students, that's the junior faculty and the research staff as well. Are you putting things in place? I, I totally agree with the others that you can't, you can't, we need to expand uh, into cloud computing, but you also need expertise in cloud computing, and that might not be just your faculty. Um, so we need yeah. to think about what kind of skill sets are important. Um, I spoke up in a chairs meeting at, that was held a long time ago. That was before that um, data scientific, or the statistical identity crisis session, because Jeff Leak was one of the brash young assistant professors. And so one of the other chairs who will go nameless said, how are you gonna get tenure doing this? And I said, it's our job to see that they get tenure. So I think the leaders in academic departments need to evaluate what's coming next and don't hire someone if you don't have a plan for giving them everything they need to succeed. It's still a lot of work to succeed, but they shouldn't have to define it on their own. And I wrote down some of my thoughts on that for, for that session where I was the gray-haired um, <laughs> gray haired department chair representative among much younger participants. Um, but it's in American Statistician in 2018 on documenting and evaluating data science. And uh, I don't think it's a comprehensive list, but as a result of publishing that, I write a lot of promotion letters for people <laughs> and who, uh, you know, it, it, it's simple things like there's a lot of work that goes into data management and data curation. Treat it like a publication. Uh, under the new data sharing policies at NIH, you need to have DOIs for your data set. We need to recognize that's a contribution to science. That's a contribution to the field. It shouldn't just be buried in your CV as, oh yeah, I managed some data for somebody. Put it in there, put the DOI, put the citations that people use it because um, creating reusable data is a part of the reproducibility cycle. Mm -hmm. Same thing with code. We don't cite code. We don't cite data as universally as we should, but I think we need to advocate for that. It's part of doing um, science in a data science era is, is treating our contributions like contributions. Uh, they should be something someone else can use. You've influenced, you've changed the way things go, and I want you to get credit for that. Thanks. Thanks to you all. Um, really great perspectives, a diverse, diversity of opinions. Um, so I think I'm going to change gears uh, out of the, the academic question and come back to a point that uh, Jeff made in his talk about this rising floor of quantitative skills uh, across disciplines and the fact that everyone you meet can now uh, fit a lasso model. And what does that mean for us? I think Jeff was thinking along the lines that, that you know, maybe this presents some challenges and a need for rethinking of, of how we approach collaborations. We've also had a comment in the chat that this could also be uh, a way to, uh, or, or an opportunity uh, for us in that the rising amount of 
um, of quantitative knowledge amongst our collaborators could lead to more opportunities for leadership positions and a more a greater appreciation for what we bring to the table as a scientific collaborator. So I'd open it to um, to, to you all to, to further comment on on this trend uh, of, of a rise in quantitative skill sets among uh, our collaborators. I think I think we play an important role of interpreters too. So a lot of people can fit things, but they get a lot of output. Um, and, and there's a little pattern matching that goes on. I mean, that's how I, I learn things too. I generate the same function with on my own data and I try to see how it's interpreted by others. But as we build up experience with that, someone who can run it, so they can run it, but they may not um, quite get what's coming out of it, or it may look confusing. And I think we can help in, interpret that. And that brings us in sort of a senior interpretive role on what these uh, methods mean. I we get a lot of questions when someone has done something and asks, um, it's not doing what we thought it might. What does this mean? Is this a is it a bug? Is it a mistake? Um, and how it rolls in. The second as, uh, the second thing I'll add is it we need to rethink how we teach. So we're currently teaching a training program to behavioral scientists in in drug related harms, um, how, and they're they're willing to code. Um, so we. I would be a waste of my time to start with very basic R programming for them because they, they're gonna be motivated by the application more than I signed up for a programming class. Can I get them up to speed through creative use of markdown and examples that they can modify? Um, we do need to fill in, we need to figure out what are the principles they need to get, but they're, they're ready to go. They're ready to experiment. They want to see a real example. So if I spend three weeks doing simple examples to motivate the theory for it, I've lost them. So I've had to rethink at what point do I, do I, um, you know, where, how deep is the water in the pool they go in? Are they willing to try to swim? And I think we want to be encouraging of experimentation, but also encouraging that they seek out help along the way and advice. It's not just push them in and yell swim from the side of the pool. Thanks, Lance. Would, it, would anyone else like to comment, or shall we move on to the next question? Oh, I can uh, maybe uh, go ahead, Jeff. No, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I share my own experience with everyone. Till last Sunday, I submitted my last prediction model for our COVID nineteen inpatients, basic patient census, and for our entire hospital systems. And after three years of this work, every week I, we generate a prediction model for how many patients you're going to see in your hospital and in your ICU. After I submit last submit, our dean and our CEO sent me the email say, you know, you guys generate the accuracy is almost 99.72% for next 10 to two, two weeks, the inpatient census data, which helped the hospital help the medical school to arrange their manpower to basically smartly, wisely use the statistical result to regroup their manpower to take care of how many they need extra, the travelers, the nurse to take care of the ICU patient. I think one hand we need to show our true value added to the top level to when we have that chance, we need to show statistics, not just P value. Statistics generate can help the entire institution, entire uh, you know, entire hospital system. They can help you to deal with uh, to have a better decision to make. That was one. I still need to go back to the leadership. I still think we as the group need to really. I hate to use the word more aggressively. Whenever we have a chance, we need to show our leadership not only within the statistical field, but really outside the statistical field. And then that is the, I think that is the culture we think I would, I would like to suggest we change that and then, then to, to really stand up. We are not sitting here to generate statistical inference only. We have more 30,000 feet above ground, actually those vision, those leadership characteristic, as well as we have an excellent communication and then we have all those skills on top of those. That's what how I feel. Um, I guess I have sort of two, two reactions to something like the rising floor and quantitative expertise among collaborators. I think the first, in collaborations, at best, I feel like 
strong quantitative experience makes the whole collaborative team more effective. And what I mean by that is if I'm working with somebody who knows enough statistics to know sort of where the limitations are in their knowledge, but can also leverage that quantitative expertise to communicate effectively, they're sort of doing their part in that collaboration in the same way that it's my job to know enough about the science to be able to communicate effectively, but, but not overlap perfectly. So, so again, at best, and I think this happens fairly often, I have a lot of very great collaborators, especially in environmental health, they know enough stuff that we can communicate very effectively, while also they're not sort of reaching too far. They know sort of a good point to say, this is where we need to bring in biostatistical expertise. And I, I think that's like that's sort of the mirror image of me knowing enough, just enough about environmental health. I'm never going to be an environmental health scientist, but I know enough that I can do my part in that team. And I think that that I, I agree completely. I think that opens up an avenue for leadership in those sorts of collaborations. I think the other reaction that I have to this point is that we we probably need to think very carefully about education programs. Um, I, I teach a class on our programming that a whole bunch of MPH students at a school of public health take. And very often, MPH students from outside of biostatistics are very competitive for jobs in data science because they can import a data set and use ggplot and fit linear regression and interpret the results very effectively and can do all of that in a way where they're also coming from a perspective that values the public health knowledge that is critical if you're going to be effective in those cases. And so I, I think recognizing, you know, how is this going to shape the way that I collaborate with other professionals? Great. I'm, I'm thrilled about that. How is it going to shape how we teach the next generation of biostatisticians to be effective public health data scientists? I think we need to think very carefully about what skill set um, we want we want to train for there. Thanks. I think if it's okay, uh, Shihong, will unless you have uh, something you'd really yeah, like. Yeah, I, I, I want to uh, I want to add, uh, okay. add uh, a, a, a one point. Yes, the I think the uh, so right now I feel the the collaborators and compared to ten years ago, especially students, they are much more quantitative, and uh, so compared to the old days, and so they know um, those cutting edge uh, method and uh, for example like uh, the, the lasso like that was mentioned and the uh, random forest and uh, they know all those uh, methods and so this is on one way it is wonderful that the collaborators become more quantitative and so it makes the communication easier between the statistician and the, the non-statistician collaborators and uh, so in the meantime and also uh, make the bar for statisticians and uh, to higher in order for the collaboration to be more productive. And so for example, giving the students are using all using those fancy methods and what is the role the statistician can play. And so this is something we need to think harder. And so for example, that one example is that it would be useful for us to so um, sometimes they don't understand the assumption as well as the statistician. And so, for example, lasso method and um, for and the elastic net. And so, what in what situation one method work better? And in uh, the and also like uh, um, uh, for um, then uh, so and also like for random forest and the whether one should use a random forest or the boosting and the random forest uh, or the bagging, how they differ. And then, so, you know, those type of things also make the bar for statistician higher in order for us to be an effective collaborator. So that makes us to need, we need to understand the method better and then tell them and the, what your data look like and the, what is the assumption of those existing method and the, those methods may work and the, in this situation may not work in the other situation. Thank you. So I, we have we have just one minute left. So I'm gonna ask the panelists the hardest question yet because I, I've seen some questions come from students into the chat and unfortunately we won't be able to hit on every question. But one of the themes I've seen in, in, in several questions is, you know, what can we do as students who are still in our training to position ourselves well to be uh, competitive, not just for traditional biostatistics jobs, but jobs with a more sort of data science bent. So I will ask you each in, in one sentence, if you can give one sentence worth of advice to a current student, what would that be? 
I start with computational skill. Okay, it's a, a direct sentence, computational skill, okay. I'd say read a lot, find the, find the people in your department who work in this area, who you feel get it, you know, that you feel heard and ask them questions, talk to them. Uh, that's, you know, that's part of their job. They look busy, but they, I, I would guarantee 98% of us love talking to students. That was a run on sentence, Lance, but, but great. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm also going to have a run on sentence, but I think, um, one of the things that will make you most effective on the job market is a willingness to engage and be curious about real problems and that that is absolutely a skill set that you can practice so be curious and think about what kinds of things you might do and and focus on on sort of fostering that curiosity and intellectual ambition and engagement is she hung any parting words of advice for our students? My my um, final uh, remark is let's be open minded, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so yeah. I think, I think that's a beautiful sentiment to end uh, this great discussion on. So I'll I'll finish by thanking again our panelists, thanking everybody for uh, the questions and your time today, um, and look forward to greater engagement with this community on this topic in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.